Hey, right hey, here. Kevin. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the CAD Dimensions 3D Printing Podcast. You know, at CAD Dimensions, we have this mission to equip engineers with the best tools possible that enable them to do better things for the world. And we think this podcast is just one small way that we can, you know, spread the message about all the great technology out there. Uh, my name is Adam, and joining me is... Ken. Kevin, hey. And behind the camera... I'm Ben. Is bad. So this is our, our normal podcast crew. What we're going to do is we're going to go over a lot of the recent uh, popular topics in the general 3D printing and technology space. We're going to start with some that were very popular over the last month or so, and then end with two stories that were a little bit more on the, the technical end of things, but were still pretty, pretty impressive um, over the last month or so. Uh, so the first thing that I wanted to get out of the way right away was... There was Rice University, which I really should have looked up where it is. Um, Texas. I feel like I should know where that is, too. Texas. I feel like come like tournament time, I'm always looking up, like, where are these colleges? That yeah. I don't know Texas. About once a year. It's in Texas. I don't know, I don't know what sure. city, but it's in I Texas. I can buy that. Are you sure? Yes. Okay. Guaranteed. Uh, I mean, here's Google. For some reason, I thought it was outside of the United States. Nope. Texas. We're going to look like idiots. This better be shorter when we get out of here. You know, Texas doing... Houston. Great, Houston, Texas. Rice Texas. University. Uh, this is going to make so much sense for stereotypes of Texans because they made, they 3D printed plastic blocks that were actually bulletproof. Yeah. And so I'm sure they had just firing ranges everywhere where they could easily test these things out. Well, as, you can open carry in, in Texas, can't oh. you? Or so you just walk around with, with guns. It's yeah, like maybe they west in some places. did this on the sidewalk. Who oh. knows? <laughs> um, <laughs> so, but it's not, so it's po important to point out that it's not a matter of material strength that's standing right. up to these firearm shells. It, it's it's a specific pattern that yes. they proprietarily engineered, it looks like. Like right? research. I don't it's just, know just through it's, research? It's a lot of trial and error. Yeah. <laughs> it seems like it would be. I don't think it's proprietary necessarily. What they did was they looked at carbon nanotubes, right? Okay. You know those things that we heard about in science fiction? I thought those were just, like, really good at conducting. I had no idea they had no, they're bulletproof really, properties. No, they really, really strong. Strong. Stiffness. Like, if you think of how diamonds are just incredibly strong, diamonds are all carbon Carbon nanotubes are like microscopic carbon arranged very specifically. So they looked at that pattern and then they replicated it on like a macro scale that you could actually see. And they 3D printed this this intricate pattern. Okay. So to look at it ignorantly, it looks like they just had some trial and error and made a really <laughs> huge thick block and shot it and said, hey, this worked. But they also compared but it, it but to... But there's science behind it. It's and they, not. And they compared it to a solid block. So okay. you have a solid block, and then you have an engineered, lighter weight, very specific block. So but how do you define solid? Well, if it's solid, you know. But like, it's 3D printed, there's no, so there's spaces, there's and no there's like, you know, you can see film material minimal. and shape to it, and there's like a cross hatching. Do you see the solid and, block? Like this one is the engineered one, and this one's the solid one. Okay. So... <laughs> That, that makes more sense. It's solid. <laughs> yeah, I see that correlation. Okay, 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 okay. You sold me. Well, you can print with 100% infill yeah. without any grid pattern on the inside of a print. Yeah. Yeah, and tri trial and error isn't bad as long as you can prove mathematically why things are happening. That's the end goal. Is at the end of the study, you want to be able to prove why it happened and then be able to repeat it. You're right, right. The whole uh, scientific method there. Yeah. It's important. Did you look at how fast this thing is moving? 5.8 kilometers a second. How fast is that? Because, like, I'm not, well, I don't have a like great reference a, for kilometers a 5K, per second. A 5K running is, what, 3.1 miles. Okay. So that's doing a 5K every second. Okay, so it's pretty fast. How's yeah, that? it takes me about 20 minutes. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. every it's second is really second. fast. 19... <laughs> All right, into feet per second. It's more than a 5K. 19,000 feet per second. 19,000. I thought that was pretty fast. What? Okay, so... Okay. I mean... That's a lot of feet in a second. <laughs> the fastest bullet on the commercial market is a little bit over 4,000 feet per second. And this I, is more than twice that. I looked at my that. own ballistics charts Four. for my rifles, and yeah. the fastest one I have is like 2,500 feet per second. And this is doing. And that's going really fast. And this is doing 9,000? 19. 19. 19. Okay. 
So that's really fast. so they didn't just take a 22 <laughs> out back and say, "Wow, it stopped my, my 38 special or whatever." Or, uh, and purse I, gun. I think it's more like some serious stopping power. I feel like when I read headlines that are like, "Oh, new bulletproof material," yeah. they use a 22. It's it's always like a nine millimeter or right. something like very small. Um, in the in the Tesla Cybertruck um, demo, they showed like a high speed of a nine millimeter bouncing off the outer shell. But this is like a high power rifle. No, 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 no. no, no. Wasn't that that? That's faster than fifty cal? That is faster than any bullet you can fire out of a rifle with. Well, then how they even do that? I don't know. This, this sounds like <laughs> a, a magnetic gun. Okay. I was going to say, the gun is more impressive now than the damn thing that yeah. stops they, they had to have fired something in a controlled, yeah. controlled way. But light. nonetheless, I mean, so long-term implications of this, you know, how expensive is it to produce Kevlar if you can do something like this with just a, you know, topology optimization yeah. system? That's unique, so. And, and further, they did, um, like, compression tests yeah. on these blocks, too, and the results were incredible compared yeah. to even the solid one. So I think this is... Talking about, like, structural material now? Like, building material? Well, it's so like, like, one of the problems with Kevlar is it's just like a fabric, basically. Yeah. So if you shoot somebody, it's still, whether or not the bullet penetrates them, it's like you're getting hit with a sledgehammer. Right. So if this has some cushioning... Right. The stopping power, cool. and, and yeah, it doesn't have the gift, right? It's not going to pierce you, but it's going to feel like you got hit. Yeah, and with this, if it absorbs that much of the impact, it might not feel like that anymore. Right. Yeah, and the microstructure depends like the direction something gets hit. Because if you look at like an atom structure like titanium, mm -hmm. if you print, if you've ever seen a print of the actual titanium atom structure, you can see looking at it. I've seen it all the time. Yeah. 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 Never <laughs> chart about my pen, so. Yes. It's actually the background <laughs> on my phone. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Why do you pretend uh, like we have no idea what you're talking? If about? you've ever, if you've ever seen this, I've actually got to see one, and um. If you look at it and pinch it from one direction, it is incredibly strong, just like we associate titanium. But if you turn it 90 degrees, it'll like snap like a toothpick. Hmm. Hmm. Just because of the 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 way the atom is. It's like a tungsten. Yeah. Tungsten is is very very hard. Like you can't cut through it, but mm -hmm. you can easily like take a hammer and smash it. Yep. Huh. That's um, brittle. That's right. brittle. Yeah. 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 Well, okay, not easily, but you could. <laughs> Huh. Interesting. Well, yeah, I mean, there's some uh, neat applications that could come from that. You could see how people could incorporate pieces of that into all sorts of things that they're already 3D printing to reinforce stuff and yeah. add all sorts of depth to things. So it's pretty neat. I'm, I'm not sure bulletproof is necessarily the end use of this concept. Um, I started thinking about you know our metal printing, mm -hmm. right? Or even just like the plastic printing services that we do where people will quickly jump to, oh, this part needs to be solved. Right, and when you ask me a couple questions, why does it need to be solid? Can we, like, they're usually complaining about cost. I'm like, well, if we make it less dense on the inside, that'll lower the material usage, mm -hmm. will lower your cost. And they, they insist that, <clears throat> excuse me, has to be solid. But in this case, you know, the lightweight structure was actually stronger than the solid structure. And so for, you know, any part that you want to be lightweight and strong, mm -hmm. you know, playing with these different patterns could dramatically affect that. Mm -hmm. Because I think, cool. what, I think where my brain goes. Yeah, and even a little more practical than saying that like it's going to be stronger than a solid part, I think that we can find, specifically look for specific pattern types that sacrifice the least to mm. get lighter. So when you look at like aerospace and those kind of markets where obviously the, light is, the light, lighter we can make something, the better, but you still have a standard to which you have to uphold for, for strength. Mm -hmm. So maybe not maybe not talking so about how th how little material do I need, or I guess kind of, but not how, not specifically the amount of material and weight, but what pattern can allow me to use the least amount so of material. <clears throat> then what happens when you apply the science of that pattern and the topology that we know is obviously successful to hardened materials already, like Altem and things like that? I mean, so we've talked about it before, but the does it like max out like what it can do or? Kind of the, the whole... At some point, every material maxes well, out. Yeah, yeah, but I mean... It can I don't break. Know. What do you think, guys? <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's interesting to me. They don't actually tell you what material they're using. Yeah. So we don't know if they're using, like, an SLA process or an FDM process mm -hmm. or, you know, what resin they're using. Um, they don't give you tons of details. Um, in fact, the most detail they give you about the design is that it's based on... I wrote down this word because I thought it was kind of neat... 
tubulanes. Oh yeah, it's the yeah, tubulanes I saw that. of carbon nanotubes. Tubulane. <laughs> whatever, whatever that That's means. That's like the surfing lane in California. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's all on the it's left. A, it's, it's not the tubular, HOV, It's tubulane. Tubular tastic uh, structure. If Chipotle can very, have very a strong. Chipotle lane, they can have a tube tubulane. By the way, if anyone has a file of this, yeah, whether Please or not, share it with yeah. Us. yeah, because whether or not we'll I'm allowed it. to use it we on can. this channel here. Without a doubt, I want to just ballistics test this with all of my own friends. <laughs> I'll share it online. Maybe not on this place. But we'll do it. But I will try it. Yeah, that would be a really a bit from bed. fun idea. You know, I'm sure the people at Rice University need, you know, independent verification. Or something. So yeah, you know, there you go. I can do that. We're willing volunteer yeah. right here to, to test it out. Um, but moving on a little bit, uh, lightweight, strong structures obviously apply to aerospace. In, in terms of 3D printing, but it can also apply to high-end automotive. And mm -hmm. so there was a story that probably the last eight weeks, we're, we're a little late on this podcast, but over the last eight weeks... Um, we missed a month. We did. Yeah. We did. We oh, did. don't tell people that. Scheduling conflicts. They might not know. Um, <laughs> we, we do this podcast every month um, unless, you know... Other Somebody picks up cat litter, per se. Per se. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We don't, we don't need to go there. Unless scheduling conflicts arise. Hey, Adam, um, how's your back? <laughs> it's doing much better. Thank you for asking. Um, there was a story about a father and son heartwarmingly building a 3D-printed Lamborghini together. Yeah, yeah. Um, and large-scale 3D printing and 3D printing of cars is kind of a neat concept that has been, I think, growing steadily a little bit. Um, I know you mentioned there's a company called Local Motors that yep. 3D prints Vehicles. So very different applications. Very different. Uh, one one's is a in hobby. A, one's in a Ventador <laughs> uh, that has a gigantic Chevy V8 in it and looks yeah. like it could kick some serious ass. The other uh, looks very innocuous. It's a uh, like a people mover for like larger cities. Okay. Um, but it's neat because it's an entirely autonomous vehicle that's kind of like a short, okay. short little bus. That is... Uh, it holds, like, what, eight people? Yeah, eight to ten people. Okay. And it doesn't have, like, a preordained path or track or cart. It mm. just, you know, flows through traffic like everything else, and it's an autonomous bus. But it's okay. but almost all of it is 3D printed. Huh. Uh, tons and tons of components of it are 3D printed, and it's touting itself as uh, the world's first 3D printed car company to be, you know, dedicated solely to that. So huh. it's, it's neat that... Um, We've seen a lot of cool stuff like this. Uh, cities that have congestion problems. Yeah. We, where we live in the frozen tundra of upstate New York, not too bad. But you go to Boston, go to D.C., go to Chicago, uh, go to New York, where they're you know going to charge you to go cross town now. Uh, things like this are going to have to be more ingratiated into big cities if we're going to accommodate these huge population surges. So I could see stuff like this catch on. You were saying. It's uh, in, in Denver at the airport where it's, uh, where it's taken <laughs> off. There was an no. airport where... We don't know which airport, but I know... It was an airport. I was just guessing. It was, it was being tested because they, you know, like... <laughs> I've been to a couple airports where they have, like, the, the, the people mover trains under terminals yeah. or between terminals. Yeah. yeah. This has been played in that same concept where you could have this stay on, like, a track on the tarmac and just move yeah. people back and forth. Well, and then I was saying, so my brother uh, lives in Los Angeles and sent me... Uh, or I saw it on his Snapchat or his uh, Instagram, a little motorized autonomous vehicle that was delivering food in East uh, West Hollywood. That makes me so happy. It was just like you're walking <laughs> it was, it was just at, a, at a crosswalk in Hollywood and all of a sudden this little thing just scoots on I think, by. I think a lot of times. And it had like a DoorDash logo on it or something. It? Like you could, yeah, you could read it was branded or something. Like it must have been like a pilot or something. But we live in a day and age where Amazon will deliver it to your house That's via drone cool. in some cities. It so makes me so happy. We're just isolated in New York. Like It's not coming here yet. A lot of times when I'm talking to people about like autonomous vehicles or electric vehicles or anything like that, they'll be like, oh, there's no way I'm letting a robot drive me anywhere. But like, I really want to live in a world where a little robot can just bring me food from down the I'm street. I'm good with that. Like, that sounds awesome. I yes. don't have to go anywhere. You know, people don't have to sit in traffic. Yeah. Um, robots don't take sick days. All those good advantages. Um, they don't get hurt. Yeah. They don't, uh... That's a good question. Uh, what if this little robot runs over someone? Is anyone it's held too small. accountable? It's adorable. It's just a, a it fun was little very food small. robot. I, honestly, a unless toddler. you're a child. No toddler is crawling. It would have to be <laughs> zooming at you to take you out. Where are that toddler's parents, Ben? That's what I want to ask. <laughs> 
You're crawling in the sidewalk. In LA, <laughs> but in the day and age of you know this stuff that we see Boston Dynamics doing, you combine that with some of these things, and you can get some really neat stuff. That's yeah. Again, unfortunately, not going to come to sunny upstate New York anytime soon. But you know, it, it's got to start somewhere. And if you, you're in one of these big cities, Seattle and San Francisco, and you guys are experiencing this, tell us what you think. If you've seen stuff like this, you say that, but we are like one of the hotbeds for military drone testing. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. There's a ton of that up here, and um, I know that has more to do with the geography. You can access does. a lot of geography types here, but yeah. this is the, every the day I go border in the country. Every right? every, yeah. every day I go yeah. home, there's there's a U.S. drone oh, flying, flying over around my head too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we live down the street from each other, yeah. so that's gonna be. I just had a great uh, application for the 3D printed body armor. Boston Dynamics, they're already creating a people hunter. Why not be a people hunter? That's so scary. <laughs> the, the Atlas. Atlas isn't a people hunter, it does backflips and parkour. Eventually. It's just for fun. No. <laughs> It'll never be used to catch us. It's just a fun science fair project. Um, that you can you put body armor on. Arm it. <laughs> anyway, I don't know about great segue, Patton. Let's not talk about robots <laughs> killing everyone. Um, it might come to upstate because a we are in like the hotbed of drone research. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah that's a good and point. also I've heard a lot about autonomous electric. And I feel like three D printing just kind of works its way in there mm-hmm. because it's relatively low volume. And it's inexpensive. In time, and it's inexpensive, and it's highly customizable. Yeah. Um, for first mile and last mile transportation, mm-hmm. um, specifically around package delivery, and so a lot of people don't know that generally the first and last mile of any delivery application most is the expensive. most expensive Absolutely. Time. Like, Every commute, too. Same thing. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, we can fill a cargo boat or a plane full of stuff and move large amounts, you know, in mass from point to point, but then getting it to its final destination is very expensive. The gas for the FedEx truck to go from the depot to your house is the single most biggest incursion of the whole process. And the time. Exactly. Right. Right. Um... So, as we were saying, Stratasys has been doing multi-material printing. Object was doing multi-material printing even before that for a long time Mm -hmm. with liquids, so it's very close. Um, But theirs is unique in how the nozzles are arranged. I think that allows them to switch materials really, really quickly and print a little bit faster than most 3D printers. And so what they did to demonstrate this was they printed a flexible like silicone material and then a rigid plastic together Mm -hmm. in the same shape and then designed it correctly so that they could apply a vacuum and kind of suck the air out of some sections and make a little walking robot with Uh. it. The video that you shared is absolutely adorable. Oh, thank it you. Looks like a little, it looks like a little plastic centipede, like to yeah. Be the <laughs> That's probably why it got so popular online. Yeah, catchy stuff like the that. the cuteness of the multi-material. Yeah, baby Yoda riding robot. it, it'd be perfect. Oh, it would, baby Yoda. Yeah. You know, we should just spend the rest of the podcast and talk about. We should just baby print Yoda. a baby Yoda. <laughs> you know, let's commit to doing wow. that. Right here, you know? It is now our entire mission in life and this podcast is just to to get baby Yoda out into the universe even more than it has been. Yeah, um, I think we found a grab cat of it. <coughs> oh, really? Yeah, yeah. There's a few models floating around. I know. Um, but anyway, I think this year as a whole has been probably a milestone year for multi-material and multi-color 3d printing being explored in different ways Mm -hmm. what would you what would you think yeah i think both on the uh consumer and industrial scale um there were a couple different consumer level systems that came out specifically looking at color and you look at the filament based ones there's been one or two new additions in the i guess you could still call it filament but essentially they use a white filament and a printer inkjet head to color the filament and then we've the j750 has been out for a little bit but obviously they've made pretty large improvements to that system as well in terms of capability yeah just in the last year and a half i'd say uh stratasys has updated our materials to be much more vivid than when the machine initially came out like you hold two parts next to each other the difference is very progressed a lot well now they're pantone certified and yeah uh yeah it's very different yeah more materials more color and then I don't know with polyjet necessarily. I don't think a lot of change in mechanical properties. I mm-hmm. think it's been more focused on stepping up the realism factor, not the mechanical. Mainly because if if you're really going for mechanical, you mm-hmm. just go back to FDM. To FDM. Yeah. Uh, speaking of that, the the Harvard robot 
will switch seamlessly between materials up to 50 times per second. Okay. So that's, that's, that's the rate at which it's changing over materials. That's very fast. I think uh, that's faster yeah. than our polyjet. Uh, that's a bold claim, man. Yeah, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know if we can make that claim on a microphone. I don't want to. I don't want to commit to that. Um, it's certainly neat, and, and you know what? I mean, this is what you're seeing. You're seeing people experiment with other stuff. Um, you know, this is more and more I think, innovation. I think a big difference between our technology and the Harvard technology is material blending. So mm. they might switch very quickly, <clears throat> which is great. It's impressive and all that. But we blend materials a lot more actively. And we mm -hmm. use that to get a broader range in what we can print all in one build tray. Mm -hmm. So, like, I think it's eight materials that they can use at one time, mm -hmm. which is impressive. Yeah. Um, and certainly above the capability of most printers. But when you have six or seven materials, like the J750 does, and then you can blend them, you can get, you know, essentially hundreds of colors because you can blend right. them in different combinations. Yeah, you can definitely see a stark <clears throat> contrast between... Here is red. Here right. is blue. Here is yellow. There are here is soft. Distinct. Here is rigid. Yes, that's, that's yes. it. You're not yes. blending them to get different properties in different places. Yes. Also, how many times will you need fifty different materials in one print? I mean, it's not really materials, cool. just fifty changes. Fifty changes in a second. So in a model. Yeah. <laughs> Once. Okay. The, the other part of that you said was like just how quickly it can print something. Mm -hmm. The other thing you got to look at with a lot of systems is what's the goal of the system. So with that. With that machine particularly, it's advertising 14 micron layers. Mm -hmm. We know that takes longer. Yeah. But that's because the goal is to make it as small of a layer as possible to make it look as nice as possible. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, you can, they just added a new mode with the machine where you're printing 52 micron layers for, for draft mode. And that thing, you're, <laughs> you're, you're cutting the print time by like quarter. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a great point. I think a lot of times... Print speed can be advertised in like a lot of different printer spec sheets, but like layer height has a huge effect on your overall print speed. Same thing with like nozzle diameter, layer heights, infill. It all it all takes into effect. Yeah, a lot of variables. Definitely. Um, the very last thing that I wanted to talk about. I think this is cool. Was one of the coolest things that I saw coming out of Forum Next. So Forum Next, if you don't know, was just at the end of November. It's probably the world's biggest, or in the top three at least, <laughs> biggest 3D printing trade shows. It's where a lot of companies make new announcements. Um, and it's roughly in November, you know, every single year. Um, did you see anything that, like, really caught your eye from Forum Next? I'm putting you on the spot here. I apologize. Mm. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> specific ones? Because other than this, I saw a lot of, like, incremental improvements from a lot of companies. Yeah, there was a few new machines launched. Yeah. Um, like, X1 launched a new metal printer. Desktop Metal announced the shop system. They yep. announced fiber, you know, kind of around Form Next. Um, and none of those were super surprising or groundbreaking to me. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's impressive uh, what they're doing. Um, but it wasn't like a brand incremental new... change. Exactly, yeah. exactly. <clears throat> Impressive, but an incremental step. Growth you're expecting in their in their Just product line. Sure. Um, Glassimer is a startup that won uh, the startup competition at Formnex, and they are 3D printing optically clear glass, which is something that I've never heard of being done before. That's so cool. Yeah. So what did, what does that mean optically clear? Does that mean like it's it's optic level or yeah. Jesus. That's my understanding, at least. I yeah. believe you can use it for glasses. Yeah, so you can use it for glasses, you can use it for making microscopes, you cameras, can use it for cameras. And, um, there's um, a lot, and the optics industry is huge. Yeah. There's so many things. Satellites. I don't know if I'm saying the word correctly, but I'm pretty sure you're just comparing it by opacity. Just how well you can shine light through Opaqueness? an object. Opaqueness? It's, I, think it's, I think it's opacity. opacity is yeah. actually how, how, how easily light travels through an object. Yeah, yeah but... Um, like we've worked with a handful of optics companies, and optics are typically pretty expensive. Yeah. Because it's really difficult to manufacture them to the right level of uh -huh. opacity. And now that word just sounds weird in my head, so I'm never gonna be That's able to say it again. That's the absolute best word. <laughs> it's the word of the day. That and tubules, tubulanes, 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 and opacity. Um, and so their process, I think, from just reading a little bit on their website, is just like an SLA process. 
and they have a material that goes into an SLA 3D printer, and it has suspended glass particles, and so you print a glass part, and then you debind and sinter it to get an optically clear glass part. See, and I, okay, because I was going to ask if you didn't bring it up, because I was thinking, like, a nozzle with, like, liquid glass, like, and it's We've seen coming that out of that. Like, We've that seen that was before, the first but it hasn't I been... I think MIT did that But years how could ago. you control that? And how could yeah. You, yeah that'd it's be fun. super hot. You get, like, really thick glass layers right. that, like, look as cool art pieces, but it's not like, oh, I'm Functional pulling objects. a drinking glass that's clear out of my cap. Right, right. Let alone, here, this can go in your telescope, or... Right. Yeah. Right. The other problem is when you talk about what systems used to exist, the, the challenge is with optics, the optics industry is the precision. Like, they live in a super high-precision world where those types of systems, any kind of almost layering system, is probably out of their realm already just because of thickness. Yeah. I'm looking at a threaded glass bolt on their website. Yeah? On Glassware's website? Yeah. Put the the picture up in the the frame so the audience can see. That's precision. (laughs) Right here. (laughs) It's like a Disney World when there's all of a sudden a princess standing on your hand. Yes. (laughs) Just add it, add it in post, Ben. Please and thank you. <laughs> um, 3D printing as a whole is difficult to make really transparent objects. So normally transparent objects like glass or anything, they're either extruded or they're molded. That way you have one shape and you can get smoothness on the outside. Because 3D printing works in layers, generally those layers can cause non-opacity in your object. Um, so I find it just really impressive that they were able to find or create a material and a process that makes optically clear glass. Microfluidics. We provide photocurable glassmer materials. Interesting. This is really neat. Yeah, so it's a polymer and it's a glass glassmer. But then, yeah, on their website you can see some examples of different stuff that they've made and um, kind of explains it a little bit more. That's so cool. Yeah. Everyone in the company wears glasses, basically. by the way. Yeah. Whoa, whoa. Is that true? Is uh, that looking at their, the company page, and they all have glasses on. Ah, so yeah. this is a self-serving yeah. Yeah. from <laughs> the beginning. Necessity is the mother of <laughs> So true. Um, but I think this points to 3D printing being used in new ways, which is always kind of neat. Um, but also it's pointing to 3D printing being a part of a larger manufacturing process, like desktop metal works in a similar print debind center yep. process. Now we're seeing it being used with glass. I'm sure we'll start to see it being used with ceramics and other materials yeah. where it's it's growing outside of plastic very quickly and I think that's kind of an exciting trend to to look at. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Um, that is the last story that we had to that's what's new. talk about today. That's what you need to know. That's what's new in 3D printing over the last 8 to 15 weeks. No, that's an exaggeration. We had another podcast before. before yes, now. we've been very six busy. weeks. <laughs> we've been very busy, and you know what? It's, this is the technically this is uh, the last one of the year. Is it right? Maybe uh, last maybe one not. of the decade. Wow, last are podcast. Are we going to do the more? Decade. You know what? Maybe not. What was that? That mean? was a camera die. <laughs> I thought so. Look into this lens. Okay, <laughs> over here. Happy holidays, everybody! Thank you for watching this podcast. We look forward to connecting with all of you. Uh, in 2020. Leave comments. Let us know what you want to see next. Have a good day. <laughs> Bye. That was a good one.